I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her, has lured her away from here. Personally, I think someone came up here and grabbed her and ran down the hill. I think so, and too. And threw her in a car and drove as far away as they could from this area. I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself or off this yard. Hey, it's Dr. Phil here. Please subscribe to the Behavior Panel. All right. So we good? You ready? Sure. Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the True Crime Workshop with Greg. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase? I am Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military. Wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. Nowadays, I train everyday people and intelligence operatives in the same. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Put together the True Crime Workshop at truecrimeworkshop.com with Scott Rouse. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about Summer Wells. And we're talking about her. We've got a lot of requests to do her. So again, the panelists have have spoken, and we're going to do what they suggest. So uh, Summer Wells is a little girl who's missing from Kingston, Tennessee. And we have um, an interview, a couple of interviews to take a look at, of her parents. Greg found the footage. Greg, what, what do you got? Yeah, I think it's Kingsport. It's up in the corner up in Tennessee. And what we have oh, is Kingsport. Her, her, yeah, her, her father and her mother. And there are clips that are interspersed, some with both of them together and some with just the father. Um, she's been missing now. I think today is day 14. And the mm. father released a statement early, went in, in front of a camera and did a full interview for, I think, eight or nine minutes. The mother only last night came out, and this is all that we have from them. This is an active case, guys. Nobody knows where this little girl is or where she's missing. What we want you to pay attention to is we might be joking at times, but it certainly is not about this, this little girl. Anything that we find funny or any of that kind of thing will not be about this little girl. If you have yeah. any tips please contact authorities. If you have any ideas, please contact authorities. Not conjecture, tips. This little girl's yeah. still missing. Yeah. All right, well, let's take a look at the uh, first video. You guys ready? Yeah. Here we go. I can't imagine how you've been feeling these past couple of days. Yeah, it's been rough. But we know, you know, we believe in the resurrection. I've never seen so many Christians in one place in my life, like I say, and it's, that's pretty awesome to see that. And I just hope God in His, in his mercies will deliver someone home to us. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so interesting in terms of the, uh, I guess, uh, content of what he talks about, you know, can't, I can't imagine how you're feeling, and he defers to society, religion, and God. So interesting deferral. I'm not sure really what it says, but it, it isn't necessarily talking about his specific feelings, though it could be an element of, I guess, feeling supported by um, by society, by the religion, by the, the God involved. Anyway, with sound off, uh, on the whole, very comforting gestures around around the sun. So uh, that felt good to me. Downward inflections in the voice when you've got the sound on, that sounds assured. So comfort, assurance. Uh, his weight is forward as well. So that seems like he's kind of leaning into the story. He wants to deliver information to him, to, to us. Tongue grooming beforehand. I'll just say now that I see that throughout. I think that's a, a consistent kind of preparation before he speaks, though Though I'm open to other views on, on that. For me, it seemed like a, a baseline preparation that he always does. Boy's head is hung. Um, is, that, is that shame? Is that grief? Is it just the sunlight? They're facing into the sun at the moment. Not sure at this point. But anyway, that's, that's what I've got as a, as a first off on this uh, first piece here. Uh, Chase, what do you got for us? Yeah, agree with you, Mark. 
And this is a clip where we're not seeing much emotion. We're not seeing a lot of anger, sadness, stress, or anything else. And just you watching this as a, a, an interesting data point for you as a panelist is that the reporter didn't ask a question. The, port, the reporter used what's called a provocative statement. And this is part of a, a licitation that people in the intelligence community get trained on. As far as I know, this is the first thing you learn when you learn about getting information out of people. And I think the reason that this unrehearsed statement about resurrection really came up is because no question was asked. And in the intelligence community, we uh, they have a saying that says, the more sensitive the information you need, the less questions you should be asking. So the more we want to default to elicitation. And I think that's why this came out. I think it's also interesting that he defaults to saying we believe in the resurrection, which suggests or denotes that he is either made the decision that she's not coming back or she's dead or that he's just uh, already aware of it. And I think it's interesting with his son there beside him that I think they're providing each other equal amounts of comfort. I think the son is also become a pacifier for him. And it, it, you see in his high stress moments, he increases the physical contact and movement on the sun, kind of reassuring him, pulling him in a little bit closer. Not a whole lot of certainty here about what this means yet. So this is just the first video. We'll get to the next one. Scott? Right. Uh, usually when somebody goes straight to religion right out of the gate, that's a red flag for me. I believe in uh, resurrection never seen so many Christians in one place in my life. But in this case, I think it's it's a little bit different. I think it, in, in this situation, this guy probably hasn't done a lot of public speaking. He probably doesn't know what to say. So I think maybe out of nervousness, he goes right to that. Now, his background is a little bit sketchy as far as uh, getting in trouble for things. So he's been, he's gotten a little bit of trouble before. So that may be something to help shine him up, make him look good. Make, help spiff him up a little bit for people watching. Oh, he's a good guy, just in case. And and I agree, Chase. He's used that little boy as an adapter, you know, holding on to him. But I think they both are because it, it's a it's a trying time. Not seeing a whole lot of grief here. Not seeing tons of it anyway. You, you can tell the guy's not. In the, he, he's 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 down. But those are are more sleepy movements. He looks tired, really, more than anything t to me in the, in this case. His blink rate is through the roof. So that's, it, it could be a tick. Sometimes it's high and sometimes it's not. So it could be that he's nervous, could, could be when the first, uh, when the first interview starts, it might be one of his first ones, I don't know. So he may be a little bit nervous about that. And we, when we look at these nonverbals as well, culture is gonna play a, a huge part in this. The way they act, the way they stand, the way they deliver the information that they're, they're gonna give us. So keep that in mind as we go through and I'll point out some other things to let you know that. His voice is fairly monotone as well. But we know, you know, we believe in the resurrection. I've never seen so many Christians in one place in my life. Like I saw you. And let's start paying attention to how many times he says and and so, because we see that pop up at some key points over and over and over and over and over in some of this. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so if I start off, I'm going to say that your experience colors who you are and how you respond. I always say the organism does what the organism does. If you've been in trouble with the law, if you've got drama in your house, if you've been arrested a few months ago for domestic things, you're going to feel uncomfortable in front of a camera and under scrutiny. Doesn't mean that you did something to your child. It simply means that you got baggage associated with that, number one. Number two, he comes out of the gate immediately with religion, but he doesn't say, as God is my witness. He says, we believe in the resurrection. We believe in the resurrection. That automatically makes you think that he assumes the girl's dead, but there could be another reason. And guys, I'm not making an excuse. I'm just gonna tell you why that could happen. If you've converted to a religion, Maslow's hierarchy among people who have the same religion is saying the same things. And he probably rarely speaks outside of church. I saw the other day, he's in, he's in Seventh-day Adventist, and he was up talking in front of the church. So it's probably a standard line he does every time he stands in front of people. And maybe a catchphrase, not literally a catchphrase only, but a way that makes him more comfortable. At the same time, he's gripping that little kid's shoulder, and the kid is getting comfort too. But at one point, he's gripping the kid's shoulder, and the kid looks up at him like, hey, that's a little tight. So it's, it's just, it's an adapter, as you guys have already said. 
in terms of sadness, you know, I always talk about this muscle and refer to this as a grief muscle, but it really isn't a single muscle. What's happening there with people is all these muscles, and I won't ever remember the name of them except for the big ones, but as these muscles, as you feel sad or sorrow, that internal part of the brow rises, the other brow comes down. And then as that's happening, most of us, when we're sad, our, our brow rises. And this is fighting that is how you get a little arch there. It's a bunch of muscles involved that causes that look. What you need to be paying attention to when someone, I just read a study yesterday from 2012, and I will put it down in the, in, below. But they said that the frontalis muscle blowing out the grief, all those grief lines is the best indicator of deception that most people can notice. So when the person's doing what I call request for approval, instead of that, it shows something. So here you see a little bit of an arch, but not much, but you do see that sadness. You see his, his eyebrows lifted up and the indicators of grief or sadness or that arch, the brows lifted and the corners of the mouth down. He has facial hair, but look at the corners of his mouth. They're drawn. He has some tears in his eyes or sweat. Hard to tell. It is hot. It is Tennessee this time of the year. He doesn't stance, he doesn't take high ground, he simply uses that religion piece. And he is adapting, we typically would say those are red flags and the, and the flash, the blink flash, the blink rate goes through the roof. So I'd pay attention, those things make me wonder if he knows something, but we'll go through this as we go. Remembering that it's, I'll show you one really good indicator that's hard to fake. It's really hard to fake your this up and your brow and your lids down unless you're sad. Your lids down and your brow up that way usually indicates somebody's sad. Um, this going immediately to worst case makes us all feel like he's knows the girl's dead. But if you have been in prison a few times, if you've been in trouble and things typically go badly for you, you might assume that they're all going to go bad for you. So try to try to read what a person's been through and that gives you the next piece. And that's what I got. Excellent. I can't imagine how you've been feeling these past couple of days. Yeah, it's been rough. But we know, you know, we believe in the resurrection. I've never seen so many Christians in one place in my life. Like I said, that's, that's pretty awesome to see that. And I just hope God in His, in his mercies will deliver someone home to us. We good? Yep. Yeah. All right. We really miss her very much. She was the angel our blessing the love of our life sure she, she's what made our world go around all right greg what do you got so the first thing that jumps off the plate to me and we have to put, take this into account and chase you're going to talk about some of this in great detail but is lack of forehead involvement she doesn't use her forehead much at all now the one thing we know is that people who are not interested in social engagement don't use their forehead much because that's the way we signal each other i think it was desmond morris who called it billboard of emotion or billboard of something and so it's a way for me to connect with you across the room she doesn't do much of that She's also doing a lot of internal conversation or what I assume is internal conversation is she's over here and just kind of rolling through what should I say. At one point when she is saying she was our little. We really miss her very much. She was the angel, our blessing. She almost says something else, I think, before she says angel, because she says later she would keep the boys in line and that kind of thing. But if you're talking about a child who has disappeared, you certainly don't want to disparage them if you are if you love them and care. Usually people who are disparaging are the people who hated the person who is gone. And just like our last week's guest, who's saying how bad his wife was and how badly she beat him. Usually you don't disparage him, so you look for better words about the person. She does a double shoulder rise, kind of in helplessness at one point in here. And then she goes back to... She does make eye contact one time. I typically think of looking at mood in addition to body language. We talk a lot about body language, but if you think about energy, focus, and direction for a person, you can think a lot about all the rest of the stuff is painting on a palette. In her case, all of her energy is internally focused. It's low and her alignment is scattered. She's all over the place with her mind. That typically I associate with confusion. Now you can paint a lot of things on top of the confusion palette, but that's the way I look at it. And what I see here is that. If on the other hand, if she were low external and or and scattered or low external and focused, I would say now she's secretive because she's paying attention to something that's coming. Don't see that. Here's what I see. Now realize this is a baseline for her and our first time seeing her. So we'll go from there. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> we remembered. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. All right. <laughs> He just over there just <laughs> selling that, man. Just, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. So, I only knew because I started out with, I didn't really get to see this video, and Scott goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder, I was starting to laugh, and I wondered if you were saying something horrific. And I was like, <laughs> oh, man. All right. That's a good one. I think uh, in this video we're seeing, let's just talk about the, the verbals in this video instead of the nonverbals. Everything that's being said here is in past tense, as if uh, the likes and dislikes and who the daughter is, is no longer a current reality. She was. And I think that's interesting. And we're talking about her facial movement. I think what we're seeing here, I'm not a doctor, but I did spend eight years studying neuroscience at some kind of cool university. However, I think what we're seeing here is late stage Bell's palsy, which is a, some damage or a problem with the seventh cranial nerve that affects one side of the face where you see this paralysis. And you start to see some of that paralysis in the side of her face, I think. it's You can see it in the development of her cheekbones. But I will give you a PSA. If you th These symptoms are sudden onset. Bell's palsy is a sudden onset disorder, much like a stroke. So if you see some symptoms where somebody's face is paralyzed, but they are able to move their forehead, you should treat it like a stroke immediately. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, I agree with you a, a lot on that. We're not seeing a whole lot of facial movement in this. And it is a little bit odd. It's a little bit wonky looking when you, uh, when you start paying attention to it. Again, here, she looks worn out. She looks sleepy. She looks like she's been going through a lot, which obviously uh, she looks worried. And I think the behavior we're seeing shows that. One thing that I'm not seeing that would show me deception is is sort of what Greg was getting to a, a minute ago. They're not talking to each other. They're not looking at each other, checking with each other, they're checking each other's looks or what they're saying. Like in the last two fake plea videos, we see a lot of that stuff, checking each other out, seeing what they're saying eyes directly looking at that person here we're not seeing that we're not seeing them in other words touch base on what what i'm saying is that is that okay so far none of that um i think that single eyebrow raise is actually an illustrator because illustrators is how you your brain emphasizes specific words or phrases like i just did then specific words or phrases so since she doesn't do that much at all i think that's what her eyebrows are doing i think it's it's doing that they don't to act as an illustrator and her eyes are are sort of like an illustrator but an enhancer when she when those eyes go up real big and that's how she expresses that that's important or it's a big deal the shoulders the shoulder shrugs i think are just something where she's trying to express she's looking for words to express how she feels but she's she doesn't have the words she do, i don't think she has the words so i think that's what we're seeing there and these the, this is going it's odd what we're seeing fairly odd compared to what we're used to seeing so, Greg, what do you got? Or, Mark, what do you got? Sorry. Uh, so, uh, interesting, Greg, that you talk about the mood there. I think that's a nice thing to look at. Uh, emotions, heightened emotions will last kind of maximum 10 minutes. It's about all the body can really stand of a heightened emotion. Moods can go on for hours. Uh, if moods go on for days, we often call them affective disorders. They're a little more than a mood maybe sum it more up what's interesting with this is is the mood of the male and the female are very very similar they seem to kind of fit together we've got the male with his arm out they seem to be quite connected not only kind of physically but in their in their rhythm in their mood and that speaks to me about something of a family going on here, a connected family. Now, I know you might have all kinds of information around, you know, this this family, but however a family performs, you know, now and again, they seem to be performing uh, really together at this point. So that's an interesting data point. Uh, you know, as said before, we've often seen in other films of videos of families dealing with this kind of situation, two very disparate people 
different rhythms, disconnected from each other. Doesn't seem the case here. I think you're right, Scott, searching for these words. There's a lot of confusion there, a lot of difficulty finding the words, but she does find the metaphor, which is she's what made our world go around. She's what made our world go around. It's that idea of the world has now stopped. That's a big, strong image that the child has gone, the world has now stopped. She's what made our world go around. And I wouldn't, I would, ex I would expect that metaphor with real grief. So although we might not be seeing it in the face here, the metaphor speaks to me of a real massive change in life. The world has literally stopped, it stopped turning, life as, as they know it is not the same. So that's quite powerful, I think. Everything stopped. It's, it's shock, it's confusion, it's devastation. There, that's what I got for you. We really miss her very much. She was the angel, our blessing. The love of our life. Sure, she's what made our world go around. Let's move on. And can you tell us a little bit, you know, what Summer was doing that afternoon or that evening? She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother, and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door, and she went into the house, and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, where's Summer? She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. And so she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. All right. Greg, what do you got? One interesting thing throughout everything we're going to see this guy do is that he has the same cadence almost exactly throughout every interview he's done, which is interesting for me because it makes me think, okay, that's kind of a baseline for him. Yeah, it's slow, it's drawling and that kind of thing, but that's how he speaks. In this storytelling, you cannot miss that he's storytelling because his cadence changes. If you pay attention, when he goes into storytelling mode and he said, I was not home when this happened, and then he starts down this third party story and you can tell he's repeating what he's been told. She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door and she went into the house and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, where's Summer? She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. That's all he's got. Not a single verbal bridge, not a, and then after that, just walks through the details. And I, I am having a hard time. I'm looking at him because his brow is up in the center. His mouth is down. His lids are low, but he's also out in the sun. So I'm not going to read everything into it. I am going to say he's gripping his kid. He's got that same thing where he's gripping him and he's, he's adapting. If this were... He was home and he was telling me the story. I would probably call it a red flag because the cadence changes. But knowing that he's heard this second, third hand, so so no big deal. However, it is with that and blink rates and all of that, we have to look for positives as well. He's illustrating with his right hand. Now he can't with his left hand, but he is illustrating the story with his right hand. And you see what Chase, I think you would call body narration when he's moving around a little bit as well, trying to get the message across. And then he does a sour taste, as you would say, Mark. It's hard to tell with all the facial hair. Mm. But he does a sour taste and shakes his head like this when he's saying she was gone. And so you would expect that's negative and negative. And, you know, a lot of people would say shaking his head no when he's telling you something that doesn't mean that means that it's it's a lie. We all know that's not the truth. We know that we're looking for it to match the message he's delivering. And Chase, I think you had a great one recently where the guy went like this for yes and like this for no, that's a big deal. But if the guy's saying it was a bad thing and he does that, then you expect it to be something different. Right. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I would say, again, tongue grooming before speaking. So for me, uh, I think that, you know, these little bits of tongue action that we see always before he speaks is just, he always prepares like that. 
Um, I don't think we're seeing any kind of preparation around around potential deceit or or anything that that you might read on the internet about lip licking or tongue juts or or whatever i think again it's it's kind of baseline for him he'd probably do the same at church when he gets up to speak uh the boys were on the internet of course the boys were on the internet of course kind of interested by by that is that about you know, is that an alibi? Is that a, about, well, aren't they, you know, a, set, a, a sense of annoyance around kids all, always being on the internet? That, that of course, um, is, is of interest. Why are you trying to point that out? So I'm keeping my eyes and ears open around that piece there. But on the whole, like he's forward and agreeable. When I turn the sound off, you know, although we get some of these head shakes, which are about very specific things, he's very forward. He's very agreeable. Um, he's not displaying many of the things that we've seen in the past when we know or suspect that somebody is, is trying to hold back information. And especially in this case, I agree, Greg, he is taking us through the story that he's heard from his from his wife. And from what I've heard of her story, it really doesn't deviate from that at all, which makes me feel like he doesn't feel like he needs to add anything. He kind of thinks it's good as it is. It's, it's good enough. That story that, that does the, that does the job, whatever job that's meant to do, that does the job. He doesn't need to add anything. He doesn't need to take anything away from it. So it's, it's, you know, it's, Pretty good at the moment. Uh, Chase, what do you got for us? Yeah, I agree with you guys. Absolutely here. I, and, and I will say that the lip licking thing, I will always treat as a potential marker for deception uh, until I see otherwise. And obviously it's just, it's going into a pile. We're not going to see it and say, none of us will ever tell you that one of these behaviors, it means that somebody's being deceptive. But once they get into a pile uh, they start to uh, start to become a little more solid ground. So I would always suggest for any reporter that's interviewing these people, start your interview with some truthful questions. Where do you work? How long have you worked there? Tell us, uh, you know, about, you know, what you like about doing what you do or, you know, things that people are willing to talk about and get some baseline for people like us to help out. Uh, so let's go with some red flags since you guys are, uh, let's go with some things that might suggest otherwise. The story is focused on in innocence with a, only a tiny mention of the disappearance. And there's no uh, attempt whatsoever to get us how he feels. There's no emotion uh, conveyed here at all. And also another failure to mention the name of the victim. And finally, one thing that Almost universally, people who are missing a child and go on TV do, they have zero problem completely overtaking the interview and stomping all over the reporter's question to get out exactly what they want to get out. They do not answer questions as if they're trying to pass a test. Uh, and I think this is also uh, one of those indicators. Maybe this should be one of, one of our things on our checklist. But uh, people who we've seen in the past who have these videos and they're genuine, they have no problem derailing uh, the interview to talk about uh, getting the child back. And there's no mention of getting Summer back in this video. Scott? All right. Um, he, uh, th this gives me the feeling that, that he's told this a lot, he's heard this a lot, and, and it gives me the feeling he wasn't there um, at the beginning, which I believe we under the impression he wasn't there from the, the information we got. Um, the reason I think that is because his recall on this, like Greg was talking about, is great. She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother, and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door, and she went into the house, and the boys were on the Internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, where's Summer? She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. 
I mean, he's just, he's repeat, he's speeding right along and he's repeating the same story he's heard over and over and over for the past few days. He's heard his wife tell it a thousand times because they've been sitting there. Now tell me again what happened. That's how you find those inconsistencies in a story that you can box them in with. You ask him the same thing. Not only do you ask him, somebody else will ask him, and he's heard it a lot, so he's just cruising right there. That's why his arm is going in a circular motion, almost like, well, here's what happened, here's what happened. That's why he can speed through it like that. And he sort of keeps this mode happening. He's in listening mode, and we know that because his head's tilted a little bit, and that ear comes forward just a little bit, and that lets you know someone is, that gives you the impression someone is, is listening to you. And as he's going through this, he goes, and, so, and this happened, and then, the, then the, and this happened. So they went in. That's another thing. These these words that are linked, these conjunctions, linking these link, linking these things together, are just there's information and information. A little break and. And she wanted to go into the house, so my wife watched her go into the door, and she went into the house, and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when so he's going through, remember it in those in those chunks like that um not using any barriers he doesn't look stressed and the only really illustrator he's using is his arm when he's doing that little movement with his arm i don't see him trying to 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 block anything i don't see him trying to hold back anything i think he's given up all he knows about this at this point uh, again let's pay attention to all the times he says and and so as we run through this all right we good yeah She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother, and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door, and she went into the house, and the boys were on the internet, of course, and she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, where's Summer? She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. Good, let's move. And my mother and her were planting flowers. And we went in after we got done washing our hands and she got a piece of candy from grandma and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers. And I said, okay, and I walked her all the way over to the porch and I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer, I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back. And I asked the boys where their sister was, and they said, she went downstairs, Mom, to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times, and I didn't get no answer, which was unusual, because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight she was just gone all right chase what do you got this is mostly truthful if we have minimal deception indicators here these rolling along with the story not a whole lot of eye accessing and not a whole lot of random eye accessing uh limited mention of the child's name until she's quoting herself saying the child's name and almost no emotion here. So I'm sure that they went through a lot of emotion. I'm not sure if they've already processed the thought that maybe they believe that it's it's a finalized thing and everything is over with now uh, and, and there's no hope. And she's gone through all that already. Uh, but at, at this point, I would expect to see a lot more emotion from the person. But I do think this is a, a truthful statement. Mark? <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. So the detail. There's a lot of detail in there, uh, which for me is is significant. Um, that there's there's importance within the detail of of the life of the child and the life of the family, and it's not uh, externalized. They're not distracting us by going out somewhere else. It's very much the internal story going on uh, and I can see it as well it's described well enough that I can see it happening I think that's that's significant it's a good enough story that I can see it. I've heard other people in my time tell stories where you're just going I can't visualize that happening I don't I don't I don't make sense 
this does make sense at the moment. Um, the, the eyes are consistent and, and the body are consistently um, uh, telling us the geography of it. And the geography seems to fit with where she is right now. So again, there's consistency there, which feels good to me. Uh, the father tells the same story. She's telling it with more detail. But the basic story and the basic geography is not being elaborated on or changed in any kind of way. It's consistent. And then at the end there, for sure, we see surprise on Gone. And I think we could be seeing some fear as well. Now, fear and surprise have some very similar elements to them. Uh, fear is actually strangely more subtle than surprise. Uh, and the reason for that is, is if you're going to show surprise, show fear to uh, your friend who might be hunting and gathering with you, you wouldn't want to show that because there's a, a predator in front of you. You'd want to show it subtly enough that they get it and the predator doesn't. Because if the predator sees or smells the fear, they'll come into attack. So fear is actually quite a subtle uh, gesture. I think we see quite a big gesture of fear. Uh, sorry, a big gesture of, of surprise, something subtler around the fear. And I think we see some welling up in the eyes as well of some emotion of, of sorrow. So again, feels pretty pretty good to me what I'm what I'm seeing there in terms of just as Chase was saying, what what, what might be true and what might be deceitful, it feels pretty true to me. Uh, Greg, what do you have? So when I look for somebody who is going from comfort to discomfort or whatever state you want to look for when a person's lying and afraid of being caught, one of the first things I notice is respiration. And you can tell hers doesn't increase, which is interesting. That's a great indicator. And Chase, I think you're dead on, mostly truthful. And do, does a person feel guilt when their kid goes missing if they're not involved? Absolutely, I would say. Mark, her storytelling? Exactly. There was there were 10 opportunities in that story to chaff. 10. She went downstairs and the left the, the left handrail on the stairs is broken. And I'm always worried. None of that. Just facts. Just getting out the facts, telling you what she knew. There's also the and. And Scott, you brought it out earlier with with Don. When a person is telling you a story and they sound the same, not it's not because they rehearsed. Those are internal to family, internal to social groups, speech patterns and 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 including in culture we can even have mispronounced words that become acceptable within a culture things like jewelry i love that that people transpose letters and we just pretend like it's normal that's the way we talk we accept it she does illustrate in this case but with her body because she has such low head low forehead involvement you know if i had that i probably wouldn't have all these wrinkles in my head but she also voice changes when she's saying what the boy said, she illustrates that she brings it to life with her voice and she uses her hand when she's pointing to where she was. This looks like a story where she's telling the whole story and using everything she possibly has. She could be a brilliant liar and telling us something we don't know. Doesn't look like that here. We don't see a lot of deception unless Scott blows us out of the water here in just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> then I do see concern in her brow when she says that was unusual and you see that I narrow on that side. Great indicator that this story feels real when you're watching her. Now, she has unusual mannerisms. And so there's a lot of stuff that, as you said, Chase, I'd love to see some emotion here. And I don't. I see some concern is about the most emotion I see. But as you said, Mark, she could be just worn out, don't know, or people deal with things in different ways. Scott, what do you got? Uh, I agree. You guys cover just about everything. She's not recalling a story. She's telling a story. And these things she's going through, she, she acts, this is the difference in someone who is telling you a story they've made up, that they're they're linking with these really odd things instead of just this flow, this loping of telling a story, just cruises right on through. There's no stopping, there's no uh, there's no looking around, there's no stress there. She's just telling you what happened. And I think we're seeing that here. She's telling you exactly what happened to her, from her point of view, what happened here. We're not seeing any animated or fake emotion, not seeing a whole lot of emotion. Um, but then again, she's told this same story a thousand times up to this point. So there'll be no big surprise where she was surprised before. The difference is, like Mark was saying, the difference in a, in a 
in fear and surprise is fear looks like a really calm surprise. In other words, the, the eyebrows aren't way up, but they're up. The mouth is open just a little bit, whereas in surprise, it's wide open. When you get surprised, you're sucking in all that oxygen to, to for your your muscles and, and to get ready to run or fight or decide, when you decide what you're going to do. So there's a, there's a, a big difference in, in uh, fear and surprise. Uh, I think the wide eyes are, again, illustrating those emotions she's having. And they're sort of enhancing the feelings she's having in, in that situation. I don't I don't think she, those are just, you know, uh, overdone or anything. I don't think she's overdoing them. I think she's she is overdoing it, but she's overdoing it to show the way she feels. Those are her illustrators at, at this point, I believe. And I think we'll see that running, running uh, through these videos. That's about all I've got compared to what you guys got. I've covered everything. And my mother and her were planting flowers. And we went in after we got done washing our hands. And she got a piece of candy from Grandma. And she wanted to go back over and see her brothers. And I said, okay. And I walked her all the way over to the porch. And I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer, I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back. And I asked the boys where their sister was, and they said, she went downstairs, Mom, to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times, and they didn't get no answer, which was unusual, because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight she was just gone so we good, good. yeah good not knowing what happened do you have any kind of a gut feeling about it do you have any kind of an instinct feeling about it i wish i did Just some bad person grabbed her but we have no idea that the fbi and the police have covered every single base everything that anybody can think of they've covered Okay, I'll go first on this one. This is the first one where I said, wait a minute, something's not right here. Bunch of red flags up in this one. It's fairly short. There's a lot going on. I won't suck up everything. Don't worry, you guys. Uh, the first thing right out of the gate on this one, do you have a gut feeling about what you think about what might happen? No, I sure don't. Somebody bad must have taken her. You know, he said, I wish I did. Somebody bad grabbed her. I wish I did. Bad person grabbed her, but we have no idea that his cadence is slow, doesn't show a whole lot of stress in his voice. But man, he's moving around a lot, he's squishing back and forth, moving around that arm, gets that thing to go. And this is the first time he's really, he's really been lit up. Greg, what do you got? So I see internal conversation and distraction about what don't know. In the very beginning, you know, he's, he's got something going on where he's almost not engaged. Is it the last question? Not really sure. But he's got some internal thing going on. I do see that same, you know, lilted eyebrows up in the front. And when he's talking, I don't see this request for approval like, hey, believe me, don't you? So do I see red flags? Absolutely. When I see his blink rates go up and his respiration increase and that kind of thing, I see red flags and it makes me want to poke on him. First time I saw this video, my first thing was he knows something. Now, the, again, there's lots of reasons. We say this about people all the time. There's lots of reasons why you can feel a way and increase. This only gives us the next question. And to your point, Chase, if I were the reporter standing there, I might go and poke and say, what makes you think it's somebody or go down that path? We can't do that. We're not controlling it. We're seeing what we see here. And I would then want to ask another question is what I'm seeing. Chase, what do you got? I would do much of the same, and I would probably throw in a lot of elicitation there uh, just to just to make sure that fans out, that answer just turns into a fan. And elicitation is great for that. I, mean, I think it's uh, you, you covered the stress and you covered him becoming more illustrated, and I think it's interesting that he's becoming more illustrated telling people or wanting people to think that everything's already been done. And I would say this is a red flag because on, on a continuum of like, I want everyone to help me or I want people to think that this case is unsolvable. He's all the way on the, on the other side where he's communicating that everything's already been done. 
And there's no request. There's no saying we're running down leads where he's saying we've done everything already. It's all been done. I think that's it's unusual uh, communication from somebody missing their child. But I don't think it's necessarily deceptive. Mark? Yeah. Uh, so again, three for three, we get the, the tongue action before he starts to speak. Uh, I, I see what you're saying there, Chase. Let's not discount it uh, ever. But three for three, he always seems to start with that. But let's not discount it. You're right. Um, this is not, and, and come back at me on this, Chase, this is not a case of a missing perpetrator anymore because a perpetrator has been, has been you know, it's some, it's some bad person. And, and and has grabbed her. So there is a, a a good, strong theory about the type of person and some of the action involved. So this is better off than what we often get, which is just perpetrator, you know, the, no idea, not even mentioned, and there's no idea. However, everybody's right here that, that it, it is running, it, it, it's suggested that they're running out of leads, running out of places to go, and, and the story is, now has a sense of hopelessness to it. As the story builds, it runs out of places to go, and I believe we see his emotion build around that and we and we do start to hear some difference in the voice uh some some action in the eyes there uh around around distress sadness now i think there are all kinds of reasons why there might be some some incongruence in the stories or just juxtapositions uh, around that um but certainly this is possibly one of the most interesting elements of the story that we've seen so far because because there there is some difference between him going i have no i have no idea here's here's what we're looking for here's what i all here's what who i actually think it is anyway i'll leave it at that and just for one second think and guys again we're going to say this a hundred times body language is not magical we're not mind readers Lots of reasons you might ramp up your heart rate in that when you're thinking about a child and somebody says, who do you think took her? Or what do you think happened? And you say, we think somebody took her. Maybe it is what they think. And that might cause your respiration to go up too. So what we want you to do is to notice that every time we're looking for what should happen next and how this should tie together. What does the communication look like and how does this story come out? I think that's the big piece here. Not knowing what happened to you, any kind of a gut feeling about it? Do you have any kind of instinct feeling about it? I wish I did. It's some bad person grabbed her, but we have no idea that the FBI and the police have covered every single base, everything that anybody can think of they've covered. Okay. I'm just scared that somebody is hurting her, and there's nothing I can do about it, and it, it smothers me. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think this is truthful, and I'll just say one thing about this. We see her eyes moving around, and we see her talking, and she has comfort looking downward. She's not escaping to look downward. She's just looking away to speak, and she's comfortable about it. This, I think, is truthful because there is no attempt to manage perception. No attempt to manage perception. Greg? Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I see truthful here. There's a narrowing of her eyes at nothing I can do about it, which is a sad and negative thing. Uh, she uses, she looks up left, looks around a little bit. She rolls her eyes up in that. That's a, almost a fainting gesture, if you will, about loss of control. And, you know, what does she say? How, how horrible this is. You see that going. I don't see a barrier anywhere there. If you're thinking of her lying, she'd probably want to cover up, put something between her and you. We don't see any of that. And her speech pattern for smothered is just, you know, Scott and I talked a little bit about it. It's an odd choice of words, but culture matters. So that's what I see. Uh, Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. When she says uh, it smothers me, that's totally a cultural thing. I, I've heard that actually before. And I think you guys have covered pretty much everything. Yeah, the, even though the uh, eye roll is odd, that's another way of her expressing her emotions with it. I mean, her she's sad, but she's not good at expressing her sadness. 
uh, whether she's on something that's helping calm her nerves or not, I, I, I would vote possibly yes, unless she's just really tired. You know, she just may be worn out from, from worrying so much. Her cadence is pretty slow. Her voice tone is low. This uh, Everything rides right along the way it should, and uh, someone who, who is supposedly feeling sadness and and possibly grieving. I don't see the grief on her face. I don't see any any grieving in any of them, but that doesn't mean that's not what's happening. So, uh, yeah, I think it's all congruent with the emotions that she should be feeling at this time. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so um, so I think we are we're, we're seeing or we, or she is delivering to us in the way that she delivers emotion. She's delivering emotion to us, and and I think it's so it's triggered by this idea of an an abduction and the powerlessness of this. I will say in the video that we saw before, we do see the child react to the idea of abduction as well and get comforted around that. So there there's some important within the family there seems to be some important trigger around the the meaningfulness of this being a possibility, okay? Uh, she uses a, a, a metaphor there. It could be colloquial. I think you're right, Scott, but, but regardless of whether it's colloquial or not. It smothers me. This idea of it smothers me, it literally cuts off. That's what you do to a fire. You cut off the oxygen to it so the fire doesn't burn anymore. Fire is often considered with the idea of being alive. So this this idea of if she's abducted, the powerlessness that the mother feels, it literally is taking the life out of her, the mother, that powerless feeling. So, so though it's colloquial, it's quite a strong metaphor being used there. Yes, the eyes defocus at the at the at the end of that I, I think there's a strong possibility that there's some kind of sedative involved they've been going a long time with this we see I don't know whether we see it in any of these films but but the child in some of the films yawns I mean it's because that you know my guess is is they're up and they're up and they're up and they're worrying and they're trying to you know work this stuff out um here's where I really think we feel the emotion it smothers me. What I want you to do is listen to that intonation and then a few films on, you're gonna hear the mother talk about the kids crying and the music that she uses, the intonation of her voice, the primal cadence of it on crying is exactly the same as smothers me. I think that's one of the ways that she shows her emotion. Listen, what you've got to remember about individuals, personalities and groups and societies as well, just because you don't see them do an emotion doesn't mean they don't do it. You know, it, what it what it often means is they're just not going to do it in front of you or this isn't the place where that person or that group does the emotion. So many times I've had people come to me and go, yeah, but those people, they, they never do that. They never do this. They they don't smile. They don't cry. It's like not in front of you. They don't. And that's the important thing is that you don't get to see that because you're not part of the family. You're not part of the group. Well, here, I think we're giving an indicator of where sometimes emotions are displayed and they're in the intonation of the words, I, I believe. So so interesting piece there. There, that's what I got for you. I'm just scared that somebody is hurting her and there's nothing I can do about it. It, it smothers me. We good? Yeah. Are they asking anything of you other than just people that you might suspect or, you know, situations you might suspect? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I'm at work all the time. You know, and, you know, Candace was on one side of the house when she got gone. That, you know, not even, you know, 50, 60 feet away. You know, we know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. All right, Greg, what do you got? So he starts off with what we typically call a resume statement. He's going to say, look, I'm always working. I'm always away. And, but his hands, if you notice, when he does talk about always being away, he drops his hand and slaps his leg. It's kind of a helpless movement. He's saying we did our best. He has, she said, look, she was only 60 feet away, shaking his head. 
He's looking like I have nothing left to give you and his elbows away from his body. Those are all good signs. A resume statement we might think of as a red flag to say he's doing this. And for a little levity, if you'll notice, Kevin Williams shows up at 10 seconds and leaves at 13. (laughs) Mark, what do you got? Yeah, nice. Well done. Uh, Yeah, you know, I'm the same. There's there's, There's kind of almost an alibi put in there, you know, I, I got nothing more to give you because I'm at work all the time. I don't think it is him trying to lay down an alibi. I think it really is him going, I wish I had more for you. I, I think what we're seeing here is disbelief, confusion at the situation. I think you're right, Greg, that's what that hand slap on the thigh is about. It's it's that finality of that's all the information that I have. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't there. I wish I had more information. Information. You know, Candice was 50, 60 feet away. That's all the information that she has. His his direction illustrators are congruent around that. Again, the geography works around that. Um, uh, again, four for four, lips, lips licking before he begins speaking again. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of congruence, a lot of um, fact in his mind around what he's saying. Chase, what do you got? Absolutely agree. And and definitely agree with the lip licking. So we're starting to see this is a normal thing. So it's, 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 it's losing power as we start moving, uh, moving forward. And I think when he says, unfortunately I'm at work all the time, what makes this really truthful and different than when other people have alibis is that he doesn't focus his, statement on the day it happened i mean unfortunately i'm at work all the time he doesn't say that day i went to work at 3 15 i didn't come home till 6 50 p.m that evening so i'm at work all the time makes it more likely to be a truthful statement that's something we're more likely to see when we're looking at truthful videos i mean unfortunately i'm at work all the time and i think it was extremely unusual when he said when she got gone. You know, Candace was on one side of the house when she got gone. I think that may be a cultural thing, maybe something out there. But I also think that uh, he doesn't like his job very much. We see what's called, from a just a behavior perspective, it's not relevant uh, to the case, but we see his elbow move out when he says, I'm at work all the time. We see that little, that's indicative of disagreement. A lot of times, That's one of the first things I teach HR managers to look for in job interviews when they're interviewing people for a job. And when he says there is no way she would leave the property, I think the kid disagrees with that. We know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. I think his son disagrees, and I think we can see him break eye contact and his head goes straight down to the ground the moment he says it. We know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, I agree with a lot of that, a couple of things. But the got gone is very common uh, in southern phrase. That That's uh, it's not an Arkansas, Arkansasian phrase, however you'd say it, Chase, but in, in – uh, in in Tennessee, it's it's very common up in the mountain. South Georgia too. Yep. yep. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very common phrase. Uh, this up to this point, the the video we saw before this, a lot of movement going on, but even more here. And I think he's. I, I think you're correct about that as well. I think he's just about fed up uh, with this. Um, that's what that hand slap means. He's he's just, he just he doesn't know where to go with it from there. He I, I don't think he knows where to go with it. His cadence more than doubles again here. He's just speeding right along. He's he's already talked about where he was that day so many times. He's just getting right through it. But I think he's I think we're seeing frustration here. That's one of the one of the main things we're seeing. And I think it's the son uh, getting in the little kid's face plus the fact he's not around a bunch of adults all the time. And I think those news people are looking at him. And when he catches his eyes with him, I think that's why he's breaking eye contact. I could be wrong about that but i think i watched that from the beginning every time he looks up and, he, and you can tell because he just doesn't look down his whole body kind of scooches down i could be wrong about that because i you know we're on the other side of the camera are they asking anything of you other than just people that you might suspect or you know situations you might suspect yeah i mean unfortunately i'm at work all the time you know and, you know candace was on one side of the house when she got gone 
that, uh, you know, not even, you know, 50, 60 feet away. You know, we know she wouldn't leave the property. There's no way she would do that. All right. We good? Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's move. Good one, guys. Personally, I think someone came up here and grabbed her and ran down the hill. I think so, And too. threw her in a car and drove as far away as they could from this area. I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself or off this yard by her swing. I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her, has lured her away from here. All right, Greg, what do you got? So only a couple of things. I'm a big fan of listening to words that look out of place or looking for stress on words. And she talks about by her swing, and that is an orphaned little sentence there. She talks about, I don't think she walked away from here, by her swing, and then she stops for a second. Walk away from this property by herself or off this yard by her swing. I'm wondering what's going on in her head. Is that something she maybe shouldn't have said? Is that something maybe that they've discussed? Maybe she went down that path and that's how she disappeared. And then as he's talking, he does raise his brow for the first time. He doesn't raise it a whole lot as he's talking. Uh, she's trying to put, to figure out which words to use when she says lured. Lured is a very specific word. People that don't know you can't lure you typically, or they don't have some kind of a prize to lure you. And that's how people go after children a lot of times. Is it someone they know, or it's something that they know that child would like? You know, people use animals and that kind of thing to draw children in. So she cuts her eyes when she says lured, and she looks off. I'm assuming there's someone standing there. There's some other reason because uncharacteristic of her to cut her eyes that hard so far as what we've seen. So something's going on. I would ask, I would wonder if these are not words she's heard from the investigators. They went down by the swing, lured. Those kinds of words start to mean something when they're not usual patterns or they're orphaned. That's what I got. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, all I will say about this is, again, to, you know, Chase often has a, has a brilliant point about, you know, the missing, the case of the missing perpetrator. It seems here that, again, the perpetrator is quite clear in their minds or the possibility. They're not, they're not obfuscating from that. They're, they're, though it, though it's, it's, relatively nebulous it's pretty clear you know um um they're, they're certainly closing down the possibilities of of the type of person and how this crime may have been done and the emotion is rising as we talk about this potential uh, abductor and so again that for me uh feels pretty positive for them in terms of them being honest about this situation. Um, Chase, what do you got on this one? <laughs> you caught yourself too early. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you again. Chase, what do you got on this one? I had a lot of the same stuff that you guys did. Absolutely agree. To add one thing, I'm not just going to repeat uh, everything you guys have said. So to add one thing here, I think it's unusual that they would want you to believe that she has been driven away as far as possible. We're maximizing the scope of the investigation. Like it is infinitely, it's going to be infinitely difficult to find her. And I think with the no mention of her name, no mention of uh, recovery, and, and pleading for recovery and a lack of emotion, I think it's very possible, guilty or innocent, that they've given up on the idea of hope at this point. Uh, Scott? All right. I agree with everything you guys are saying. And I think, I think the dad has heard the TBI say this. I think that's why he's repeating it with such, from the, from the time the first interview we saw him talking, because some time has passed. I don't know how much, but obviously it's a different time. Um, I believe he heard that and believes it and is going with that. And that's why his wife jumps in and says, yeah, I believe that's what happened too. Personally, I think someone came up here and grabbed her and ran down the hill. I think so and too. And threw her in a car. So I think that's why she feels uh, so confident in what she's saying, or I feel confident in in feeling that she's not being deceptive here um, up to this point. So that's what I got. I think the swing okay. is a boundary marker for the child. When she goes out to play, it's one of those things where they say, stay by the swing. 
Don't go past the swing or don't uh, don't yeah. be, go beyond the swing. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Personally, I think someone come up here and grabbed her and ran down the hill. I think so, And too. threw her in a car and drove as far away as they could from this area. I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself or off this yard by her swing. I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her, has lured her away from here. You good? Mm-hmm. I've never seen this truck. And I've never heard of it until just recently. But I wish they would come forward and explain themselves. And if you're not a suspect, at least come forward and say what you've seen. As we begin this, the um, the subject of the truck she's talking about, that's the only thing that, that's really been brought up. I think someone uh, said they saw a truck in the area, that, a pickup truck that wasn't they they haven't seen before so that's why they're talking about looking for the person in the truck all right mark what do you got yeah so i think um the the speech pattern there is congruent with before when we when we think she's being factual so i think again she's being factual she doesn't know what this truck is she hasn't seen it before i think we uh we see some aggression on say what you've seen uh i think I think she's very strong and aggressive about this information coming coming out. Um, the male and female here are connected and congruent with each other. So again, strong family, aggression from the female on to give us the information that you have. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I, I, not a whole lot to add, except th this is one of the few times we're going to see any illustrators from her, and there are her eyes. Her eyes are moving around, and she actually shows some confusion. Why wouldn't you come in, and you can see her brows are different angles, and you can see that confusion. She's saying, why wouldn't you come and tell if you're not a suspect? Come and tell us what you've seen. I see the same thing. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right, yeah, I agree with you guys. Um not a whole lot here. Ba her baseline for what's going on pretty much is the same. Everything looks good. Her, she's using, again, the facial expressions that we are seeing are, are more enhancers and illustrators than anything else. Um, you guys cover the other stuff. Chase, what do you got? Agreed. I've never seen this truck, and I've never heard of it until just recently. But I wish they would come forward and explain themselves. I mean, if you're not a suspect, at least come forward and say what you've seen. Right. Please find it in your heart, have mercy, and find a way of letting her go and, and where we can get her back. Please bring her back home. Just let her come home, please. We miss her so much. Her brothers are so devastated that they wake up every morning crying for their sister. And as a mother, it really hurts to see your other children crying. All right, I'll go first on this one. This is the one that really bothers me. I mean, it really bothers me. It's the only time we see any emotion in the mother when she's talking about when her, uh, the other kids are crying. And she she furrows her brow there, and we actually see grief in there. And her voice goes into to a grief tone at that point. Um this is this is the emotion we've been looking for and this is the first time we see it still don't see it in, in the dad still not there that's 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 the odd thing about this whole thing is we're not seeing what we're seeing here all the way up to this point up to where they're asking for the kid to be let go or you know bring the kid the the child back um that's it, for me that's red flag town so it it's it's just odd. It's really odd. And for them not to be pleading, listen, bring the, you know, right down the barrel, the kid just like, bang, bring, please let my kid go. Then, you know, bring back. None of that. No, not, no big expressions of emotion here at all, except for that one thing on her face for the first time. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so I think we we do get this idea of group grief, like everybody's in, in grief. Uh, I, I agree it is kind of odd that the emotion comes out around the, the problem with the boys 
crying. I, I would say that we are hearing the same intonation as we get on Smothers Me. And so this idea of powerlessness um, and and so it's the I think it's the mother's idea of she can do nothing to stop them crying. She's powerless to soothe them and stop their crying. Also, we have to accept that some groups, some societies treat the females female children very different from the males that female children uh, re can be unconsciously treated as as less valuable than than males and that might be playing out here that it's that the boys need soothing and so we're not kind of quite hearing the value of the of the of the female child here um what i will say is very clear here for me where the power lies. Find a way of letting her go and let her come home. It's very clear that the power belongs to somebody else to make this happen. There's a clear idea of there's a perpetrator out there and they have the power to make this happen. And there's already a little bit of sense of hostage negotiation going on there of going, look, you're the only person who has the power to do this. Again, whether this is conscious or unconscious, uh, I'm not quite sure. Greg, what do you have on it? Yeah, I think if we go all the way back to the beginning of this, when you started off by saying, look, uh, we're, we believe in the resurrection, I think there is a, a hell of a lot of hopelessness in these people. Now, I also say whatever, whatever gets you to where you got is going to make you behave a different way. So if you've been in trouble with the police before, you're under high scrutiny and those kinds of things, you're going to be less forthcoming. It's just in your nature. And that'll come in our wrap up because it's an important fact for me. But when I watch her, I'm with you, Scott, this is a red flag. This is up until here. I'm like, yeah, here, I, I start to be really concerned because I mean, very specific words, my other children, my other children, not her, not my other children. And she really does show grief, sorrow, whatever you want to call it, in her face. And her face is asymmetric because of the nature of Chase. I think you're probably right. There's some nerve damage or something. But she's almost dejected and lifeless at this point. And then the only thing that comes out of it is that sadness about her other children, about these boys. So now we're left with a handful of things to think about. We've seen a lot of red flags that we would traditionally say, if it were person X or Y, that means this, or we're, we would be interested. We can't control the conversation. We can't go to the next step. But he is appealing. He does come out and appeal and say to the only power he has. He started off with a high power, and this is a high power. I need you to release her. I need you to find a way to release her. So he is asking for release. He is asking for what he knows how to do, and probably in a way that the organism understands. That's the way I'd look at it. Um, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you guys. I think... No emotion for the daughter, lots of emotion for the boys crying, the other children. And that stood out to me, and that made my stomach drop uh, watching it this morning. I have a big TV right there, and I just kind of sit there and watch it on there uh, in the morning uh, when we record this. And I think that there's a definite possibility there's a class of drug called benzodiazepines, which are used for acute treatment of anxiety, which acute means that I have a panic attack. I need something that's going to work really fast. And the trade-off is when I have a drug that works fast, it has a really quick half-life. Uh, one of the uh, side effects of this, it's made to treat emotional conditions like fear or anxiety. Uh, but the a side effect of this is that it treats all emotions. So it's it turns the volume down on every emotion that we can have. And even if that's true, we still saw a, a baseline of almost no emotion there for the daughter and then a spike, an unusual baseline deviation spike for the boys. And again... Uh, I have it in my notes here. I'm pretty sure there was no name mentioned here in this video of, of the child. Please find it in your heart. Have mercy and find a way of letting her go and, and where we can get her back. Please bring her back home. Just let her come home, please. We miss her so much. Her brothers are so devastated that they wake up every morning crying for their sister. 
And as a mother, it really hurts to see your other children crying. Let's uh, throw it around the room and really shortly, 30 seconds or less, tell what we think, uh, how we think it, it compares to a deception versus being truthful and sort of what you think about what's happening. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, I think I think they're being honest. Uh, I think I think the loss of emotion element, I think you're right there, Chase, there's some sedatives maybe involved. I think there are also maybe in that family or that culture, a, a, a that specific culture, uh, a different valuation on males and females, or that males must be valued more because they might be aggressive or violent. And, and especially, and especially their emotions need calming down. Uh, so, so I, I hear what everybody's saying there, but I think that might be at play a around um around this piece or certainly that's where i'm siding uh, on this one chase what do you got uh agree with you i think this is mostly truthful here and i think any deception that we see is self-management not projecting innocence it's not uh it's not out of guilt from a crime but i think in this culture especially in this area of the United States, emotion is not part of the game. And in a lot of these cultures, especially work in construction or working in these jobs like this, the more emotion you show, the less stable you're seen as, and it, it, it outcasts you from a, a group of males. And females tend to adopt those behaviors as well, especially in cultures like this. Uh, Scott? Uh, yeah, I'm, what I'm seeing here is I, I, I think you're right, Chase. I think they're the only thing we're seeing deception on is is trying to hold back the information that they've been given about whatever that situation may be. I know we all discussed this a little bit earlier, so that that's what I'm seeing there. Other than that, I think we're um, we're seeing them be honest, and we got those red flags there at the end. I'm still that still bothers me, but after this, but I think overall we're seeing. Uh, truth here, them being uh, truthful and being honest. I think we're seeing their normal behavior, you know, especially in a situation like this. I think they're they're acting normally. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to take you down the path of an interrogator. I've interrogated a lot of people. When people give you too much information about a story, let me tell you what they don't give you too much of. Names of other people who could corroborate their story. They don't include the grandmother and the three boys and to go through the whole process before the kid disappears. She was over at the swing. I went away to do something. I came back and she's gone is how people typically lie. Omission, leave it out. They don't parade the child in front of three kids that the TBI is going to talk to and the grandmother that the TBI is going to talk to. Have the whole story about candy and all that. It's not the kind of too much information you typically get. You get too much information about she stubbed her toe and, 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 and they take you away and they chaff and redirect. I can't imagine that someone who has had a run-in with the law who's trying to hide something would say, hey, let's include the kids. Let's include this, let's include that. It just doesn't make sense. So uh, while I see a lot of red flags in normal behavior, remember, if I've been in trouble with the police and I'm under high scrutiny, it doesn't matter if it was a long time ago, that's still there. And I'm missing a kid. And I just had some domestic issues recently. All that's gonna raise your fight or flight. I watched his cadence throughout this whole thing. It was pretty damn consistent throughout the whole show. Now, I'll also say her red flag was probably the most disturbing. But as you said, Chase, it can turn off all kinds of emotions, drugs can. And so let's leave it at that. I'm going to say we're mostly seeing truth. If And I will say this. If they're lying to us, wow. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. All you got to do is hit that little red thing down there where Mark is point down there there you go near his cup and then hit the little bell that shows up and i'll let you know when we have a new one out they always come out on thursdays and uh to subscribe all right well, this is a good one fellas yep. yeah thanks guys I know. yeah thanks so much and i'll see you next time yeah I'm going to say, I don't know, I guess, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know.